Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome renowned Turkish author Ayşe Kulin and literary agent Barbaros Altug to explore issues depicted in her latest novel, Imprisoned Son, considered the first post-truth era novel in Turkish literature. Welcome. I think you can hear us. Uh, I'm not, most probably, you know Ayşe Kulin, especially the Turkish audience, but I'm going to tell <coughs> some words about her uh, for the Italian audience, although she is also published here uh, in Italy, and she also got the Premier <coughs> Roma with her latest novel in Italian, not uh, uh, in Turkish, Last Train to Istanbul, and she is published all around the world in more than 25 countries. And she is well, very well known for her uh, strong female heroines in her book. Uh, she's just having that point of view through the woman's eye. And a couple of years ago, uh, she told me she wants to write something new and brave. Uh, a dystopian novel which didn't exist in Turkish literature at the moment and nobody was expecting for, from her to write a dystopian novel. So how did you come with the idea about this? Hi. I may be young at heart, but my notebook shows that I belong to the notebook age. Uh, uh, when I was a college student, I first read Orwell, and I was so impressed by what he had written. It was unlike any other literature I had read so far about <laughs> the past or the times. You know, it was an exciting novel. And uh, one word stayed with us, big brother. I thought, what a fantasy. But this fantasy has become true in our lives today. We have big brothers everywhere. We have big brother in uh, United States. We have a big brother in Russia, in China, in my country, but also in countries where democracies run smoothly. We have a big brother watching us all the time. Uh, example, I do some shopping at some shop, and immediately I get back home, and in my computer there are five, six, maybe seven, 10, or 20 alike uh, shops offering their goods to me. Everybody is watching everybody doing what they are doing, what they are buying, what they are consuming, what they like, and trying to sell their things to them. This is some, some sort of a big brother as well. And, um, well, he is partly becoming true, the big brother. And then years passed, and I read this time, Handmaid's May, uh, hand Made Tale by Margaret Atwood in the 1980s. And again, I was very impressed because I, I remember I was quite young when the Roma report was released and we became aware that the habitation, the vegetation and the, the, the fruit and the food that we, we eat is not going to be enough in a couple of years' time, maybe in 20 or 50 years' time. So uh, fertilizers had to be added to our life so that we won't go hungry. And as a mother with you know, lots of children, I was concerned about this. And in Handmaid's Maid's Tale, I came with another dystopia this time, almost as a result of the Roma report, because in a country, in a world, where you cannot have vegetation to eat, you can't really produce children like in Atwood's, uh, Margaret Atwood's book. You know, the uh, birth rate is falling, and so uh, young women are made to mate with elderly gentlemen to produce children. You know, that was another fantasy which 
uh, put an impact on me. Then came the Rio conference in 1992, where we were told about the danger of uh, what we had been doing with our um, carbon prints, and we should check what we do because we are ruining our environment. Nobody took any notice. And in Paris conference, we, were, we faced the fact with 97% of the scientists that you know, we are losing our world. Something has to be done. But again, the big brothers here and there closed their ears to that. And in 1915, I decided to write this book because we were already the, yeah. the uh, imprisoned, imprisoned son, yeah. son with this cover uh, uh, of an imaginary uh, Ramanis Republic in the future. But how many years after, I really don't know. It can be 50 years or 100 years or maybe 20 years after of our present time. And the sun on that Ramanis Republic is shielded by clouds because uh, there is a sky ship between the sun and this country. Uh, two big world powers had constructed a, a sky ship, sent it to explore into the, into the universe, and it had to explode and diminish itself, but it didn't. But it, it, they, they found out that it's going to diminish itself in 20, 25 years' time. So they have to park this object in some country. And they look for a harbor to, to land it on their sky. And uh, a very greedy leader in one country decided to get the money and let this ship stand in his own sky. But the people living in that country certainly have no idea why their sun is shielded. It's going to destroy itself in, in a certain years of time, but until that time, they have no sun. They have just the glimpse of a sun, but no sun rays. So accordingly, there are again no trees, no flowers, no, no vegetables, nothing is growing in that country. It's cold, and all the flowers are plastic, all the trees are plastic, and they are uh, sort of, uh, what you, uh, with mirrors, they, they seem to be endless, endless forests and, uh, yeah, in, in the book. Um, I wrote this book because I must say I was very much, very much uh, impressed by these two books I have read in my youth and later, and then the, the, what's happening in the world with the change of the weather. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that, like, it is in an unknown future, maybe 150 years away from today, and the technology, of course, it is very well developed in your book as well. But the information is important, but they cannot get the information they want. They can get only the information yeah. they are served by the government. That's another thing in, in the book. Uh, my, the people, they, they don't eat food like we do. They have powder food. Powder of meat, powder of chicken, powder of vegetables, powder of apple, banana, whatever. They buy the powder, mix it with some liquid, and eat that. And they have the taste of that, whatever they are eating. But it's not the real thing because they can't, it's very little. Only grown secretly in maybe back gardens of some people. And then the, the clothing they wear uh, is special. And because it's always icy on the, on the streets, they wear certain shoes. And my uh, main character is an inventor who, who invents these things. She's a woman, again, most like yeah. most <laughs> of my heroines. But again, in this country, of course, there are glimpses of what I had experienced in my homeland. Uh, the Ramanis Republic, Rama means their god, their, their religious leader. So everything is according to his uh, regulations. So the women are always secondary. They cannot work, 
until they, their latest child has reached the school age. They have to take care of their children, and every woman has to bear at least three, but preferably five children. And if they, are, they, they have more children, they are given a big award and a, and a medal for their uh, womanhood. And um, the husbands can divorce without any reason at all. Those women who cannot bear children, it's like uh, th that sort of a work where they, they, they are not expected to work, but be home, breed children, and take care of their husbands. And uh, many similar things which are in my immediate environment got into the book when I was writing the book. Uh, the Turkey, in Turkey, I come from Turkey, and um, violence towards women has a very, very high rate. We are one of the highest rating countries where the many women are killed when they want a divorce by their husbands especially. They are not, we have the laws to, to enable them to divorce, but the husbands don't let them. They come and kill their wives, and at the court, courts, somehow, they get away with some lessening punishments, and it never ends. It's, it's happening every month, a woman is either beaten up to death, or killed or stabbed. This is in the book as well. This is the routine, almost the routine of our life. And uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to ask one thing, like because you're always writing factual novels, like nowadays or even if they are historical, they are just based on the facts mainly. And you are criticizing the government and the president himself with a loud voice. Is it? May be possible that you write this novel to feel f more freed. Well, uh, this is a fantasy book yeah. to shield me from the dangers I might face. Yes. Uh, but this is also global. It's not only local yeah. because we are really facing a big uh, danger with this. Trump getting himself out of the Paris Commit. And also, like they were just talking before us, like the Brazilian president exactly. is very similar to uh, exactly. Erdogan or Putin or Trump. Exactly, they are quite alike. And I think not only my country, but I think the whole world is going crazy at a, at a very uh, mm -hmm. strong pace. Of course, um, it's difficult for me to grasp because what I was born into was a completely different world. Yeah. Not only my country has changed, because I, I was born into, I'm uh, early 40s, not by age, by birth, uh, 1940s I was born. And when I was born, in, born Turkey was a secular uh, state, uh, trying to get a proper democracy. We, we tried hard, but we had military coups every 10 years. Again, we tried hard. Now we have something even more dangerous than military coups, a re religious outlook, uh, which made it po impossible. But what, all the values that I was brought up with, like lying, lying is, is, is a bad thing. You should not lie. Now lie has become almost a virtue. The better you yeah. lie, the better you get somewhere. Especially in politics. Yes. In politics and in, in real life too, because yeah. people also, uh, with this um, digital uh, yeah. system, they add to their universities, their families, their merits, things that, that are not there. Yeah. And nobody questions and it everybody is faking accepts. Lives. It's, it's, it's lying all the time. and. Um, the religion also has changed its face because I was brought up in a um, conservative family. Of course, I had my religious education at home, uh, but what I was taught was the, the actual, the spirit, the, the meaning of, the, of my religion was taught to me. I remember one day, as an example, uh, I was playing at my grandmother's garden 
in Istanbul. I was, it must be about five or six. And um, my grandmother said to the neighbor, we had a wall between our houses, and there was a plum tree on the other side. Uh, can my grandchild have a few plums from your tree? Because, you know, she, she saw them and she likes them, which was a lie. And I said, Grandma, I don't like plums. They are it's sore. She said, shut up. And I just didn't understand why. And then, of course, in a few minutes' time, there was a plate extended to us full of plums for me. And then my grandmother, again, I was, you know, protesting. I don't want this. Why did you do this? But Grandma, you are lying. You are lying. She took me to the kitchen. She put the plums aside. She filled the dish with meat, which she was cooking. And the smell was smelling, spreading everywhere. And she said, now, because in Turkey, we have this tradition. If you ask something from your neighbor, she certain it salt or sugar or whatever, you know, she gives it to you in a cup. You always return the cup with something else. You know, you don't return it empty. So she filled the plate with meat, cooked meat, and she said, go now and thank your neighbor for the plums and take this to her, take the cup to her. I said, Grandma, you didn't have to lie. You could have just put the meat in there and give it to me and send it to her. And she said to me, no, you don't do that. Because, you know, we are wealthier than them and we eat more meat than they can ever eat. So when I cook meat, it smells, it goes to their garden, the smell goes to their garden, and I want to give them some of the meat that I'm cooking at home, but I must do it without injuring their feelings. I must do it with, with such grace that, you know, she will not think I am helping them because they are poor. I said, why? She said to me, because I'm a good Muslim. A good Muslim, never breaks hearts even when they are helping others. You know, you have to be meek and not look down on others ever. That was one lesson I had learned. And now, today, bragging has become a virtue. Lying has become a virtue. Whatever I was brought up with, all, all the... And also that, religious people, they like to show off. They are just exactly, wearing more, the exactly, most expensive exactly. things. And, and I feel really upside down yeah. <laughs> with walking on my head with my legs up because everything has shattered around me and it's another, another world with other values, another approach. It is difficult for me to adopt, but fortunately I haven't got <laughs> much to spend in this horrible post, what you call, truth area, yeah. where there is no difference between a truth and a lie or a very little thin, thin wall. Yes. And we don't even call the people who are lying liars. We call them they are in denial yeah. or, you know, <laughs> they have misunderstood or whatever. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. a dystopia we are living in, actually. I didn't think a couple of years ago. This is not a very old book. Uh, yeah, I think it was written four, four years, four yeah, years ago. Four years, yeah. I didn't think we could get into that this point. book that fast, yeah. but it happens not in my country, but all over the world. Yeah, all I can over see the world. it all over the world. Yeah. There is no escape. And also, like uh, most of the politicians that we are criticizing now from other countries are also in Turkey. They are all male. They are men. But in your novel, the independent women, like yourself, they are just saving their future, their countries. Well, um, when I was born, I was born into a very lucky period of my country. My country is not a very lucky country, not one of the lucky countries. It was an empire. It lost four-fifths of its lands. It shrunk to what we are today. We were occupied by four forces. We had to give uh, really a fantastic, unimaginable uh, struggle because we had no money. To, to be able to fight, first you need to have money. We had no money, our army was pursed, but somehow we managed 
to, to get the enemy out of the land that was left to us. And then what was left? Ignorance and sickness of all sort in Anatolia. Because the Ottomans, they uh, educated their soldiers and their statesmen at very good schools belonging to the Sarai called Enderun. They were really very well educated, but they never educated the rest of the folk. Uh, it was an empire, so we had other national uh, religions living in there, and, and the Bulgarians, the Greeks, the Armenians, the Serbians, the Bosnians, they all, if they were not Muslims, they educated their children from the age of six, seven, five, whatever. But the Muslim children, they were left to religious readings only, which was the reading of Quran. And they were taught by hojas, uh, imams, who did not speak Arabic or understand Arabic, but only know the Quran by, by heart. And they were also taught by other imams who did not speak Arabic. So it went on like this. And this, this uh, class of people, they, they, they get paid from the Sarai as ilim uh, uh, I, I can't say scientists, but uh, religious people, religious peers, they had salaries. So, and they, were, they would not go to war either. You know, they would not fight. They would not go into the army. They were free of that. So they had a very good life, and they never wanted this to change. And when Atatürk, after he won the war, wanted to educate the rest of the Turkish people living in Anatolia, he had to change into um, Latin alphabet, which was easy to understand and read and write in three months. While with Arabic letters, you have to know the language so well, it takes maybe about 10 years for you to, to uh, deshif it and write it properly, because there are no uh, vowels, you know, it's written by uh, you have to guess what you are writing. You have to be so knowledgeable that, you know, when you put the letters together, you have to guess what is, is word you're going to use. Anyway, uh, in short, we have this long history of being ignorant people in Anatolia. And in, in with Atatürk's uh, enlightenment efforts, the whole, most of the Anatolian people men especially, could read and write, also the women, because he's, he even opened schools for people uh, from the age of 20 to 60, 65, whoever wanted to learn, men or women, went to, to learn this. And th th that was the enlightenment period when I was born. People were very anxious to make their country to go forward, to go better, to know better, to, go, uh, to adopt the Western customs, but still be Muslim people, meek and religious and, you know, conservative. That, that always was the case. Mm -hmm. But uh, Especially uh, unfortunately, another movement came underneath when we were sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was uh, the fatal movement, I should say, infiltrated into our educational system, our... Uh, Judi judi judiciary. judiciary system in, into all the systems. Even in the army? So. The, the <laughs> army, of course, the army. Uh, the very first, the army, they, they pretended they were very, very secular, but actually that was a, a religious sect trying to go take us back to Sharia. Now there is this uh, two currents strong currents in Turkey. And uh, when you face a man, you meet a man, you never know what he is. This is the most most horrifying thing. You don't know whether he is Fetöcü, is, is he from the Fetö group or not? What is he? You just don't know. Uh, the, you just said that you, uh, when you wrote this book like four or five years ago, it was a, just a fantasy, but it just became so quickly yeah. as a reality. And in a year's time, yeah. we had another coup. Yes. And um, yeah. now we are run by Now this, we yeah. are run by 
Uh, I don't know of, what. Yeah. <laughs> Semi-religious. Semi yeah. yeah, but in your book, like the independence and the movement, the resistance movement is coming from the woman. It was a fantasy in your book, but uh, you believe in this. Sorry, I got carried away with what I was telling. Uh, Atatürk made a point of bringing women forth and educating them. Yeah. And when I was a child, there was already a generation of edu very educated women in all the fields, from, from medical to, there were lawyers, there were engineers, there were doctors, bankers, lots of women, and I think in that time, up to the 70s, we, we were 70% uh, rate with women in certain uh, professions. Yeah. We were very high. We have gone back now, unfortunately, but we might catch up. You, you never give hope. Do you believe in this? Like, we might catch up? <sighs> Every revolution has a counter-revolution, I think. I may not see it. But one day it will happen because, you know, better takes always over some time. It's, it's a circle, I think. It's a vicious circle that turns round and round. Okay, how, how do you feel? But uh, in yeah. this novel, yes, uh, my heroine, uh, because she couldn't bear uh, more than one child, he, he, his, her husband divorced her and she went back to the university and she became a scientist and an inventor because she's a very clever person who invents uh, many important things for the time. He is, she is given a rank, and she is given a shawl showing her rank so that people respect her. Yes. You know, she, of course, she is always after the men, but after all, she has a voice. She has a voice, she has a job, she's uh, leading a certain research group, and uh, she's doing her best, but the food they eat in the book, this powder food, it's uh, prepared so that they slightly forget the near past. Yeah. So she thinks whatever she's told by the media, which is on all the time, yes. at all times, at, and it is in only all government corners. run media. Uh, in yeah, your the government-run yeah. media. So even the history has changed for her, yeah. which is also happening for us, actually. We listen to uh, a fantastic history about our very near past, a hundred years ago, which is not what we learned at school, which is not in the yeah. documents anywhere, but it's a made up thing. Yeah. We, we, are, we are living in a dystopia. Yeah. We are living. But you still have hope. Yes. Although we yes. are living in this yes. dystopia now. Yeah, so. dystopias uh, c may turn into uh, utopias. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you, without hope, you can't live. Hope is as essential as water, I think. It yeah. is the essence of life. Yeah. Uh, we have like 10 minutes, I guess, less than 10 minutes. Yeah. Do you have? Yeah. Did we yeah. talk that much? Yes, <laughs> we talked that much, yes. <laughs> And like, and if you want to add anything, yeah, let's just go I for think, it. Uh, what you said was, should we not have hope? I have uh, put down a very clever um, comment on this. Uh, a George Cannon, whoever he is, said a very intelligent thing about this not about my country, but the whole, whole mm -hmm. uh, the world where this is happening, this post-truth uh, area. Uh, he says, we must recognize post-truth for what it is. The moment which we are dealing with, with courage, objectivity, and determination, not to be emotionally provoked or frightened by it, but just like a doctor dealing with an unruly, an unreasonable sick man. Maybe this is what we should do. Yeah. We should be determined and patient, and I'm sure it will come out, because I don't think it will lead to any good, this living in a fantasy all the time. Yes. I'm, again, speaking for the, for the Trump and for the, all the leaders that have yeah, their own fantasies. Leaders, 
European elections uh, in France, for example, Marie Le Pen is the first party. Oh, no, unfortunately. Yeah, like, yes. unfortunately. Yeah, and they are, when they are questioned, they never tell you the truth. They never tell you what they think, really. They are just telling those fantasies. Yeah, but um, finally, this is another cycle again. Too much democracy, then comes up the authoritarian regimes. Yeah. It's, it's, we have to find maybe another system yeah, which probably. enables us to preserve a good, healthy regime. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we are going to repeat everything. So do you have any questions from the audience? I don't see anything. Yeah, sure. Uh, my next book, I wrote four more books after this one, and they sort of followed each other. I mean... Uh, it was a quartet, yeah. It, it's a sort of a quartet. And my uh, next book is going to be based on historical facts of the last emperors of one of the emperors of Ottoman Empire who was assassinated but uh, again was shown as um, suicide. He cut, we always knew that he, he cut his wrists because he was a very honorable man and when they took him down the, his throne, he couldn't bear it and committed suicide, but actually he was killed. He, he, his wrists were cut and they let him bleed to death and then pretended as if it was a suicide. There was a, a court case for that. And I'm going to write seven days, starting the seven, last seven days of his life. This is what I'm reading about now, extensively uh, on both sides of all the characters that were involved in this death. So it's going to concern Turks, more than the rest of the world, but it's an interesting story, yeah. a true story in history. One of the first big mm -hmm. lies, I think, in our country. Yeah, and he was the only king who visited the whole of Europe and Egypt, came to England, went to Europe, Paris, uh, Austria. Yeah. Yeah. Very enlightened and educated. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I don't see you because like it's so dark. Yeah, it's Maybe dark. <laughs> you raise your voice. <laughs> no, I, I don't see any hands. Right. Okay, so we are just ending. Thank you for listening.